I want comes from you. Cause everything I want comes from you. Cause everything I want comes from you. I'm 
just a nobody trying to tell everybody about somebody who can save everybody cause I'm just a nobody trying to tell Jesus said, I know that 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 my Jesus said. Just a nobody trying to tell somebody out there about, about somebody, somebody who can save anybody. Oh, I know that I'm just a nobody trying to tell about. Just a nobody trying to tell somebody about somebody, somebody say anybody. I know that I'm just a no nobody. Yeah. Everybody somebody, somebody. Happy Sabbath to you all and uh, welcome to our service this morning. It is a joy to uh, gather on this platform. It's been a while since many of us have been able to gather together um, in fellowship in the church. Uh, but we thank God for these platforms that we have where we can still uh, worship together. Uh, today I wish to call your attention uh, to the book of Mark as we begin our uh, discourse together in the book of Mark and I will read from the first chapter and I'm going to read verses 21 through to 27. I'm reading from the King James Version but you are welcome to follow from whatever version you have. So Mark, the Gospel of Mark chapter 1 verses 21 through to 27. And this is what the Bible says. And they went into Capernaum, and straightway on the Sabbath day, he entered into the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority, and not as the scribes. And there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had torn him and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. And they were all amazed insomuch that they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? What new doctrine is this? 
for with authority commandeth he even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we are thankful today for your presence. We are especially grateful for your omnipresence, which reaches us, all of us, wherever we are. We pray that as we go through your word in the next few moments, you would come by and spend time with each one of us. Give us understanding of your word and may your presence have a transformative impact on our lives. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Growing up in the church, I was fortunate to have been raised in an Adventist family. My parents, my grandparents, and so I was surrounded by a church influence. And growing up in the church, even the schools that I went to were church schools mostly. And one of the things that you know you would be uh, taught over and over again is how to say no. You would be taught how to say no to drugs, uh, say no to mischief, uh, say no to smoking, say no to peer pressure, say no to premarital sex, say no to all kinds of vices. And we grew up understanding that the way to move through life is to say no. Today, I want to suggest to us that uh, in order for us to make it through life and make it into the kingdom of God, it is not enough to say no. I remember some years ago, at a church that I was attending, a certain a young lady had planned uh, to leave the country. Uh, she wanted to go and explore options and possibilities in greener pastures. And so after church service one day, she mentioned to uh, an elderly gentleman. And so uh, I happened to hear the conversation that took place. They were not uh, too far from me. And so she expressed her desire to leave. And this elderly gentleman uh, said to her, well, you know, uh, you may leave, but uh, you, know, you may leave, you may go wherever to greener pastures, you may raise the money that you, you say you want to raise, but by the time that you are ready to come back to this country, it, it may not be easy for you to fit in to the country that you will find. And then he made a statement that I want to use as the title of our message today. He says to her, you may go and when you come back, you will struggle because, says this man, nature hates vacuums. And so by the time you come back, the vacuum that was created by your departure will have been filled in your absence. And when you come back, there will be no room for you to, to fit in. You will struggle. And the money that you will have accumulated in a foreign land before you have established yourself, you could have exhausted that capital because nature hates vacuums. This is the truth that I have discovered about life, that indeed nature hates vacuums. And during these weeks and months that a lot of us have not been able to come together to worship in church, you will discover that uh, if the church cleaners have not cleaned that church in the months that it has not been in use, that church has become dirty. It has become filthy because even if it wasn't being used, nature hates vacuums and nature will find a way to fill vacuums even if it means that dust must come in and settle. That is nature trying to make use of vacuums, if it means that rodents must come in and, and make themselves at home in the holy temple, they will do that. If it means that spiders spin their cobwebs all over that, that, that building, that is what they will do because nature hates vacuums. It will use any vacuum. It will find a way to use up a vacuum because nature abhors empty spaces. 
if you look at a field, at a farm that hasn't uh, been in use for a long time, all those fields that have not been plowed and planted, you will discover that they are full of weeds and little trees and they have turned into little forests. Why? Because nature hates vacuums. And because of that, I am suggesting that it is not enough to just say no to drugs. It's not enough to say no to the devil. It is not enough. There is more that needs to be done. In fact, uh, when people talk about uh, breaking bad habits and uh, embracing new habits, you will discover that they say in order for you to break a bad habit, it is not enough for you to just say, I will stop. But you need to replace the bad habit with a good habit. I have heard when uh, chain smokers go through our five day uh, stop smoking plan, one of the things that they are told is the money that you use to use to buy cigarettes, don't just leave that money there doing nothing. Use the money and go buy fruits. Use the money and buy something else because the fact that it has not bought a cigarette doesn't mean that it, the money itself has changed. It still has the potential. So what you need to do is take that money and use it for something else. You cannot stop a bad habit simply by refraining from it. That is not enough. And so when they would say to us, say no to mischief, say no to peer pressure, say no to all these vices, that was good, but it was not enough because nature hates vacuums. You have said no to what is evil, and then what? You create an empty space, and then nature finds a way to fill that empty space. The passage that we have read in the book of Mark, chapter 1, verses 21 to 27, we find there uh, Christ and his disciples on their way, they go to Capernaum. We are told that Capernaum was located on the highway between uh, Damascus and Jerusalem, and so it was a very uh, busy uh, place. And because of the traffic between Damascus and Jerusalem, there were all kinds of people found in Jerusalem. A pure cross-section of society could be found there. And when this incident took place, it took place in the presence of a cross-section of society. Jesus is speaking in the synagogue, and as he speaks, the people understand that this is no ordinary man. He speaks as one with authority. He did not speak with the dry formalism that the scribes and the Pharisees spoke with. When he spoke, he spoke as one with authority. And oftentimes as I read scripture and as I think about Christ speaking, I begin to imagine to myself, what must it have been like to hear Jesus Christ speak? Inspired writings tell us that sometimes when Christ would speak, he would speak with tears in his voice. What must it have been like to hear the words of Christ as he speaks? One time Christ spoke to some water and when the water heard his voice, it blushed so sweetly that it turned into wine. What must it have been like to hear Christ speak? And so the people were gripped as they are listening to Christ, as he speaks, as he dispenses words of life. They are listening and they are holding on to every word that falls from the Savior's lips. Breath taken, embracing everything that he says. And all of a sudden, that silence is broken by a mad shriek of horror. When all of a sudden, the Bible tells us that a man with a devil began to scream in the presence of God. It screamed and it says, let us alone. What do you want here with us? We know who you are. It's incredible sometimes that 
the children of God don't have a proper estimate of who God is. And yet the devil himself understands who God is. He says, let us alone. I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And then Jesus, the Bible says, rebuked him, saying, hold thy peace and come out of him. And after a little struggle, the demon left from this man. And the man was delivered out of demonic possession. When you read in the book Desire of Ages, page 323, you discover that this incident, which is recorded in the first chapter of the book of Mark, is continued in the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 12. And I want to pick it up from chapter 12, verse 43 of the book of Matthew. Christ is speaking to a cross-section of people, and among the listeners is the man who has been delivered out of demonic, demonic possession. And Jesus understands that among these people who are thronging to come and hear him speak, they are impressed with his words, and yet they are not yet prepared to commit their lives entirely to him. They are happy with what they hear, but they are not yet ready to change what they do. And so Christ speaks in the hearing of all, but for the benefit of the one who has been delivered from demonic possession. And so in verse 43, the Bible says, Matthew chapter 12, this is Christ speaking and he says, when the unclean, sp when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and he findeth none. Then he says, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Then goeth he and taketh with himself seven other spirits, more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of the man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. And so Christ says, the demon leaves. And when the demon had left the heart of the man, an empty space was created. But remember that nature hates vacuums. Now that this man has, has been delivered, for him to have been delivered, it means he has said no to the devil. He has said no to temptation. He has said no to all these evil vices. But Jesus is saying to him, saying no is not enough. Because the demon has left looking for where he can make residence, and he finds none. And after a while, listen to the audacity of this demon. The demon says, I will go back to my house. Talking about your heart. I will go back to my house. And the Bible records that when the demon goes back, he finds that house in the same condition that he had once found it the first time he came in. The first time he came in, he came in, he found it empty, swept, clean, and garnished. And now he comes back and he finds the place clean, swept, and garnished. It is ready for him. But now, instead of him coming in by himself, the Bible says he goes and he gets seven more demons, more vile than himself. I don't know if that number has any significance, but if we attach any significance, in theological terms, the number seven is a number of completion, a number of perfection. This guy goes and gets the, 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 the most perfect set of demons in order to inhabit this heart, which was 
emptied, but not filled. It is good to say no, but it is not enough. One of the ways that I, I know that it is not enough to say no is I often ask uh, people, I, 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 give, I give an invisible test. The invisible test is this one. I say, imagine what you would do if you were given about 24 hours in which to exist. You could go anywhere, you could do anything, but you would be invisible. Nobody could see you. What would you do if you had 24 hours to go anywhere, do anything, anyhow? You wouldn't be caught because you are invisible. If you had that opportunity, what would you do? I'm not a prophet, but I strongly suspect that not a lot of you would be visiting the poor and feeding the hungry. I suspect that many of you would not be ministering to the needs of the less fortunate. During your time of invisibility, I suspect very much that some of you maybe would visit the Reserve Bank. Uh, some of you perhaps would visit um, service station, see if you can get yourself some fuel. Some of you could cross borders. I don't know if you are a student, some of you would go and see what, if, you can, if you can adjust your grades. Um, th there are many things that can go through our minds about what we would do if we had some time to do anything we wished and nobody could see us, nobody would catch us. That is what shows that the heart is continually evil. It is not enough to just say no. I remember for a long time, I must confess, you know, God is still working on me. There was a time when I would struggle to, uh, to fast. Now, I could go without food but I would struggle to fast. You see, going without food means, um, you know, I'd like to eat, but I don't have time. I need to rush for you know, the next meeting and I'm out of there. And, and, and then I can spend the whole day and I haven't eaten. Not because I planned not to eat, but because inevitably that's what happened. And oftentimes that's how I, I could miss meals throughout the day. But the moment I said, today, I am not going to eat. Today I am fasting. Oh my goodness. That is the day that the neighbors are baking. Those ones across the road, are, there's a braai. That is the day when your friends are visiting and they've got extra food. You, what on earth is going on? Because Everything seems to conspire against my desire to fast. So I, I used to struggle with fasting, but I discovered as I continued to grow that the struggle was because I would not have filled the empty time with prayer. Because you fast so that you can concentrate your energies on whatever it is that you are praying for. But I spent my fasting time trying to say, hey, this fast is ending at 6 p.m. <laughs> By 11 a.m., I am hungrier than I have ever been in my life. Why? Because my, I'm not concentrating on what I should be concentrating. I have created an empty space. And nature doesn't like empty spaces. And all of a sudden, those empty spaces are filled with so many temptations. Sometimes I challenge people to say, all right, if you want to see that uh, nature hates vacuums, I challenge you for the next 10 seconds, from the moment I give you the indication, for the next 10 seconds, I want you to think, okay? Just use your mind and think about 
anything in the world that you want to think about, okay? But I don't want you to think about a monkey with a blue face and a red nose, all right? Think about anything, but don't think about um, a blue-faced monkey which has a red nose. And then I say, all right, so 10 seconds, go. All right, I think 10 seconds is about done. Again, I'm not a prophet, but many of you probably spent a couple of seconds of those 10 seconds thinking, a monkey with a blue face and a red, why would I think of a monkey with a blue face and a red nose? By, by trying not to think of it, it is what is occupying your mind. You are thinking of it because you cannot just create an empty space. Nature hates empty spaces, and so nature will fill that empty space with something. And in our case, nature probably, at least for some seconds, filled that empty space with an image of a monkey with a blue face and a red nose. Nature hates vacuums. This demoniac had said no to pride, he said no to theft, he said no to selfishness, he said no to evil, he said no to the devil. But after he said no to the devil, he was supposed to say yes to Jesus. Because the empty space that is created by a no must be occupied by a yes. It is not enough to just say no. Not enough to just say no because we will find something to fill that activity with, that time with. And so Christ tells this story in the hearing of this demoniac to say, even though you have been delivered from demon possession, that is not enough. You said no to evil. Now you have to say yes to that which is good. That is what the Apostle Paul meant in Romans chapter 12, 21. Be not overcome by evil. But he didn't stop there. You then have to be proactive and overcome evil with good. Be not overcome with evil creates an empty space. I will not be overcome with evil. I will not be overcome with evil. What will you do? I don't know, but I will not be overcome with evil. Sooner or later, you will be overcome with evil. If you do not fill that space with that which is good, as the Apostle Paul admonishes, be not overcome with evil, rather overcome evil with that which is good. So you can say no, to lying, but you have to say yes to Jesus Christ. You can say no to stealing, but you have to say yes to Jesus Christ. Let him fill the empty spaces that are created by our no. And when we do this, our hearts become transformed. That is what David meant in Psalm 51. He knew that the problem is a heart that is full of evil. And even if he does not want to do that which is evil, just like what the Apostle Paul was battling with in Romans chapter 7, he says, the, the good that I, I, I want to do, I don't do. But the evil that I know I should not do, that is what I find myself doing. And David understood this dilemma. And David says, Lord, create in me a clean heart. He didn't say an empty heart, but a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. How is that done? It is done by the indwelling of Christ in the heart. Nature hates vacuums. It hates empty spaces. Sooner or later, empty spaces will be filled. It is possible that in these intervening months, ever since the lockdown began, 
it is possible that you haven't been to church. Uh, I don't know the state of uh, Beacon of Hope. I don't know if the church is still standing. Um, but in these months that people have not been gathering, something must be taking place at the church if nobody is cleaning it. And in, the, in this time that we have been uh, apart, not gathering for worship, it is possible that instead of occupying your time with worship, you decided at first not to, you know, because it's awkward. I mean, how am I going to have Sabbath school? Uh, how am I going to have uh, divine service uh, you know, at home? And then maybe you decided to kind of drift, you know, to, 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 to leave it. And the consequence of that is that you have slowly begun to drift away. I want to suggest today that we fill those empty spaces with the incredible, life-changing presence of Christ. Say no to that which is evil. Say no to all manner of vice. But say yes to Jesus. I pray that this will be your desire, your prayer, and your experience. And if it's your desire, I want to invite you, wherever you are, to indicate it, lift up your hand, bow your head, indicate it in some kind of way that this is your desire. And I'm going to pray that God will honor your desire and he will strengthen your commitment that you will accept him completely, completely. Whenever the devil has a little hold on you, you're in trouble. You need to accept Christ completely. One individual says, when Christ enters your heart and the devil knocks on your heart's door, all you need to do is just simply say, uh, Jesus, could you please get that? There's someone knocking at the door and your problems are solved. Let him in. And the Bible tells us in Revelation 3.20, Christ says, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice, let him open his heart and I will enter in and sup with him. So I pray that this will be your experience and your desire. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we are thankful for the lessons that we get from nature as we observe that nature hates vacuums. It, it abhors empty spaces. And so we pray, Father, that today you will help us to fill those empty spaces with your presence, your living presence, your dynamic presence, presence. We pray, Father, that this will be our experience. Everyone who is watching this broadcast, I pray, Father, that you will honor their commitment and their desire to fill their empty spaces with you. And when this has been done, may we be numbered amongst those who will rejoice as you break the eastern sky to come and take those who have done your will. Father, may we be in that number. This is our prayer which we know can never be accomplished without the power of the Holy Spirit. Accept us, Lord, and strengthen us from day to day as we wait for your soon return. This is our petition that we offer in Jesus' name. Amen.
Shine on.